Good morning, church. May the peace of Christ and the blessing of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to worship this summer Sunday morning. Wherever you have come from this day, whatever is on your heart, whatever lies before you in the week ahead, we know that God will meet you here today. As we come together in worship, I invite us to begin by singing our opening song together, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. Again, welcome if there are visitors, guests with us this morning. We especially greet you, and we are glad that you are here. We invite you to join with all of us following our worship today as we join for a time of food and fellowship across the entryway. I want to welcome some folks who are family members of Monty Yeager, whose memorial service was held here yesterday. I know Bonnie is with us today. Uh, back with us from Florida for a few days, and blessings to you. We are glad that you're here. I see some other familiar faces who have moved away, who have found their way back into our congregation this morning. I want to welcome those who are watching this service on YouTube and also those at Milton Senior Living and the Edgerton Care Center who are worshiping with us today as well. We come with a common faith and a common yearning. Lord, we want to be a Christian in our heart. I invite you to stand as you are able. Let's continue singing together. Those of you who have gathered in this place today, extend a hand of greeting and welcome those seated around you this morning.
Jesus and God by Brian McLaren. I am a Christian because I have confidence in Jesus Christ and all of his dimensions, those I know and those I don't. I trust Jesus. I think Jesus is right because I believe God was in Jesus in an unprecedented way. Through Jesus, I have entered into a real experiential relationship with God as Father, and I have received God's Spirit into my life. I have experienced the love of God through Jesus, and as the old hymn says, love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. As I seek to follow Jesus as my leader, guide, and teacher, I believe I am experiencing life in its fullest dimension, full of joy and love, and yes, full of struggle and challenge too. For all these reasons and more, I love Jesus. I believe Jesus embraces me and you and the whole world in the love. Please join me in the, in the call to worship. We read this responsively. Throughout the ages, the disciples have said, We will follow you wherever you go. Lord, give us the freedom to follow you in the way you have led us. We come from busy homes, filled with little time to consider Christ in our lives. Lord, give us the strength to follow you in the ways of peace. In times of struggle, we look to God for help. Lord, give us the opportunity to follow you in the ways of kindness. Today, we celebrate the Holy Spirit, who shows us the joy of following God. Lord, give us the patience to follow you in the ways of Christ. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Okay, I have a couple questions. Do we know how much things cost? 
maybe go to store even though it's since class. Okay, so I went to the store this week and I bought a candy bar. How much do we think the candy bar cost me? Two dollars? Wow. No. It cost me 75 cents. That's pretty good. It's on sale. Okay. Then I went this weekend to a swim meet and I need I was thirsty and needed to buy a bottle of water. This isn't the bottle I, bu I bought because I drank the bottle I bought. But how much do you think the bottle of water, just a simple bottle of water at a swim meet cost me? What, a dollar? Two dollars. Yeah, it was two dollars for a bottle of water. But they knew that, you know, there was nothing else you could do, so it was right there. But things cost different amounts, right? Any, anybody go to Cone Zone? Yeah? How much is ice cream at Cone Zone? Twice it. <laughs> really good? Yeah. Depends on what you get, right? So the cost depends on what you get, right? If you get something really good, it might be a little bit more. You know, if you get the big sundae with the whipped cream or if you get a banana split, it's going to be more than if you get a little cone, right? All right, I have another question. How much does it cost to follow God? It doesn't cost. It's free, right? You guys are smart this morning. Good job. It's absolutely free. So anybody can do it. You don't have to have money, right? But it doesn't cost anything. But what do we get for following God? We get more than just a candy bar, right? Or a bottle of water. Right. We get a lot more than that. We get God's love all of the time. Right? So we don't have to pay anything, but we get something amazing. That's a pretty good deal, huh? But we can still do things, right? We can show God that we follow God's love, and we can share that with other people. So it doesn't cost us anything, but we can still do stuff, right? All right. So even though it's summertime and we're not, you know, in our normal, our school routine, we can try every day to do things for God. All right? So I'm going to say a little prayer. Dear God, we are so happy that it doesn't cost us anything to follow you, to show others that you love each one of us every day. Help us to spread that love that you have for everyone to all of those around us. to see you all this morning and some of you I know have been on vacation welcome back from your summer travels <laughs> it was and South Dakota was awesome right yes it was he's now working for the South Dakota Board of Tourism <laughs> one of Jesus' teachings among many is that we care for those people in need and one of those times in need is when a person is lost to us and we come to celebrate a funeral or a memorial service. And I'm guessing almost all of us have gone through such an experience and the family gathers and people come and visit and there is a service of remembrance and a celebration of life and a celebration of the gospel and then sometimes there's a ceremony out at the, the graveside and then what happens next? Well, like every Methodist gathering, like every church gathering, we come back to eat. Well, I have to tell you that it's increasingly difficult for a lot of churches to provide that meal following a funeral. But this church has kept that tradition alive, and it is not without the effort of a lot of people. And this morning, I just wanted to take a moment to recognize them. Because you can't plan ahead. You can't circle it on a calendar. You can't only do it when you're not busy. When the need arises, these people rise to the occasion and they help serve people in a time of need. And they're not just providing food, but they're providing hospitality and welcome and friendship and fellowship and comfort. First person I want to invite to stand, and I haven't warned her of this at all, so she'll probably be embarrassed, but I want to ask Alice Reynolds to stand because Alice is going to be the person who has coordinated this. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Alice. And I want to invite Alice to remain standing and uh, 
any of the others of you who at any point have helped serve for our luncheons in here, would you please stand so we can recognize you as well? I know there's a lot of you. Shauna, Beth, <laughs> Betty, Shirley, Jane, <laughs> Bess Ann. Wonderful. And there are many, many others as well. And I just want to take that opportunity to say thank you for the ministry that you share. Again, it's not just food. It's we're really reaching out to these families, as you did yesterday for the gathering that we had for Monty's memorial service. So blessings to all of you who serve. In our time of prayer this morning, we have an opportunity, as always, to share in the joys of how God has blessed us. And I'm going to take Evan's excitedness for vacation and as our first song of or prayer of praise this morning for a time with family. Uh, what a wonderful opportunity it is to spend time with family uh, when we have the opportunity to do so. Uh, I also want to begin with a prayer that's sort of a mea culpa. I realized last Sunday, which was Father's Day, that I made it through the entire worship service and all of the prayers and made it out into the hallway following, and I realized that I had never once said anything about Father's Day. Now, my own son was sitting in the fourth row. He didn't raise his hand, nor did Ann. So it was an unintentional oversight, and so on, on all of our behalf, I want to ha wish a happy belated Father's Day to all who celebrated last week. And I have now lost my place in the Father's Hall of Fame. <laughs> Not that I was ever in it. I want to lift up a couple of other prayers that have been shared with me this morning. Again, we remember Bonnie and her family as we remember Monty. Remind you to keep Sherry Dewis in your prayers as she recuperates from surgery that she had this past week. She is home. And Luann Beal. John has told me this morning, has been hospitalized as well with uh, a recurrence of some heart rhythm difficulties that she has experienced in the past. So she is at Mercy in Janesville. And let us keep Loanne and uh, John and uh, their family in your prayers today. Are there other joys? There you go. Uh, John says he, he's looking forward to her coming home, but she is indeed in the right place. At, that, at this time. So strength and courage to you both. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Jenny. Joan is her first name? All right. For Joan, a former member of the Blue Notes who's having heart surgery courage and strength to her. Thank you for remembering her, Jenny. Thank you. Your prayers today, praises of God working in your lives, concerns that you would to lift before God and one another today. Yes, Jan. Continuing to remember Lois Scatrude, who remains at Rock Haven in Janesville. Um, difficult time for her and her family. Remember all of them in your prayers, would you? Yes, Dave. For Dave's uncle, who is his mom, Bev's brother. I'm sorry? George. George. That he might be brought through this difficult time with his health. And blessings to your mother as well, Bev. We miss her dearly. Yes. So Evan, the family of Evan Parker, uh, whose uh, service will be today and died unexpectedly. Thank you for sharing that. And Linda and, and Gaylord, welcome. Good to see you all here today. Welcome to you as well. Yes, Jane. For Charlie and Reva, for strength as he endures this difficult time. Thank you. Yes, Jean.
Well, well, Jim has his voice back, so look out. <laughs> and we're glad for you that you have. And that was a prayer request wrapped up in an announcement, or vice versa, about the patriotic concert. And you've, there's information about that on our bulletin board. So thank you, Gene. And blessings to all of you as you sing this week. Dear friends, let us lift these and the other prayers of our hearts before God this morning, shall we? Oh, gracious God, you have gifted us in so many ways. To those who have voice, we thank you for the opportunity to, to sing, especially your praise. To those of able bodied, we thank you for the vocations that you have given us that we might do your work in the world. To those whom you have opened their minds and hearts that we might receive your grace, may you strengthen us to share it with others. God, we're grateful for the opportunities to be together with friends and family. The opportunities that summer opens for some of us, at least, to spend extended time and travel and being with one another. And God, this day we remember those who might be struggling in this day with their health or challenges of one kind or another. We ask your blessings of strength to be upon Sherry and Luann, Joan, Lois, George, Charlie, Reva. We ask, O oh God, that you console the families of Monty and Evan and all who have suffered loss. We thank you, O oh God, that we are a place where we can all come matter, our status, our stature, our, our place in life, to come to hear the saving word of your gospel and the good news that Jesus brought and Jesus brings in the presence of the Holy Spirit in this place today. Gracious God, you are our hope. We trust and place our hope in you. So hear us as we pray together in one voice this day. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power glory forever. Amen. Now, dear friends, let us continue our worship by bringing before God an offering of our tithes and our gifts. Let us give generously for our good and the good of all Christ's church.
Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. Listen to this, the word of God. As the time approached when Jesus was to be taken up into heaven, he determined to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers on ahead of him. Along their way, they entered a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the Samaritan villagers refused to welcome him because he was determined to go to Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call fire from down from heaven to consume them? But Jesus turned and spoke sternly to them, and they went to another village. As Jesus and his disciples traveled along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have dens, and birds have have in, the, in the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Then Jesus said to someone else, Follow me. He replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the good news of God's kingdom. Someone else said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those in my house. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand on a plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Emmerich. As many of you may know, Emmerich is one of our lay speakers of our congregation and We are glad that he is with us today, and frequently he finds himself with opportunities to preach other places as well, and so we wish you continued blessings upon your ministry as you bring God's word to not only here, but to others in our area. As the time approached when Jesus was to be taken up into heaven, he determined to go to Jerusalem. That's the way the scripture began that Emmerich just read. Seems straightforward enough. Jesus determined to go to Jerusalem. Some of the other translations of that verse say this. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Or he steadfastly set his face toward Jerusalem. Well, Jesus, of course, did not wander aimlessly. He had a purposefulness. He was resolved He, of course, was on a divine mission. The problem is that in the ancient world, the shortest distance between two points was not necessarily a straight line. And there were no direct flights and no six-lane interstate highways. And so Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, that holy city, took him through a Samaritan village. Now, not to trivialize what that problem was, but imagine if you live in Wisconsin and you want to go to South Dakota on vacation, but Minnesota won't let you in because they don't even like Wisconsinites to be there and they don't even want to let you through to South Dakota. That's a little bit like the challenge that Jesus and his followers spent when they had to go through Samaria to get to Jerusalem. They weren't welcome, as the scripture implies. 
make it a little bit clearer, the Samaritans and Jesus did not see eye to eye. There were huge religious differences that had separated them hundreds of years before the time of Jesus. The Samaritans and the Jews who were Jesus' people did not get along. So the very fact that he was going to Jerusalem, which was the Jewish holy city, was an affront to the Samaritans. It's like he was going to worship in the wrong sanctuary. So they weren't even going to allow him the courtesy of an overnight stay along the way. This happened to Jesus a lot, by the way. Before he was even born, he went to the inn and there was no room. And now he hears is just trying to get to Jerusalem and he just wants to have a, a nice rest. Have you ever encountered an, an obstacle when you were convinced that you were doing the right thing? You know, it's easy to say when you're doing something that you probably ought not be doing and, and it doesn't work out. It's like, well, I probably shouldn't have been doing that anyway. But what if you're doing something good? Have you ever run into an obstacle and it just doesn't work out? You've heard the phrase, I'm sure, no good deed goes unpunished. Does your life ever feel that way? Well, God, I'm sure I was supposed to be doing the right thing, but this isn't working out. One of the advice columns that appears in the paper, this one is, was in the Washington Post from Carolyn Hacks, and somebody writes in with a situation and they're looking for advice. This was a woman and she wrote, my very elderly mother-in-law is in the hospital and it is apparent that she will be unable to return to her home. She's scheduled to be released from the hospital in about 12 days, but none of her children, including my husband, have made any attempt to find permanent housing for her. She can't come to stay with us or her other children, so this leaves assisted living. I, this is the daughter-in-law, have taken on the job of looking for places and arranging for visits to see places, and now I am being criticized by one of the children in particular for taking control of the situation. I'm feeling underappreciated and attacked for trying to help my mother-in-law. At this point, I want to step back and do nothing. What should I do? We find ourselves in these situations, don't we, frequently? difficult situations where we're trying to do the good thing. Our heart is in the right place, but boom, we run into a brick wall. Three years ago, a woman in Lawrence, Kansas, named Debbie Nall, she was opening her home to people in need. She frequently helps the homeless, military members, and members of, or victims, rather, of domestic violence. So in the 26 years that she lived in her three-story home in Lawrence, Kansas, she said she had helped more than 90 people when they needed it most by letting them have temporary residence in one of her six bedrooms. Well, she learned three years ago that having more than three unrelated guests for an extended period of time violated a city ordinance. And so the city told her that she was going to face large fines if she continued take people into her home. She said usually it's abused women or displaced women or people who have gotten out of a hospital who don't want to die in the hospital if people only knew the blessing that comes out of it. The point isn't necessarily how it was resolved, and I'm not saying that there weren't reasons for the ordinance, but she was trying to do a good thing, which she felt was a blessing to others, and she ran into a brick wall. Have you ever faced such a challenge when trying to do the right thing? How often do we set out on a course of action? We encounter that first obstacle, and then we just abandon the plan. Maybe it's something is we're going to go on a diet, and we start on a Monday, and on Friday night we go to a wedding rehearsal, or Saturday is a wedding reception, and by Sunday we just scrap the whole thing because we've already lost it, and there's no sense going on. Even when we are determined to do the right thing, we are so easily sidetracked. Jesus steadfastly set his face toward Jerusalem. And again, there was no room in the inn. As we figure out how this applies to us, there's another question beneath the question, and I think that question is this. Does Jesus make a difference? Now, we would all agree that in the cosmic sense, yes, Jesus makes a difference. He changed history and continues to do so. But how about for us? 
how about for you and I? In the here and now, in our daily lives, right here at this point in our lives, does Jesus make a difference? And if so, how? In 1999, I had the opportunity to attend something called the Coalition for Ministry and Daily Life. And this was for people who were finding ways to live out their Christian life in their daily lives. It wasn't for pastors, it wasn't for clergy, and I wasn't one at the time. It was people from all walks of life. It happened to be in Mundelein, Illinois. And we got together, and there was probably 50 of us, and it was one of the first times in my life that I had actually been with a group of Christians that came from all over the country. It wasn't just Wisconsinites or Minnesotans, but there happened to be the, one of the directors of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship out of Madison. There was a seaport chaplain from Rhode Island. There was a television anchor from WGN Television News in Chicago. There were a couple of retired teachers, one from Georgia and one from Alabama, and people across all sorts of the, the church around the United States, and they were of all different denominations. So there was a wonderful diversity there, and I was starting to realize firsthand for the first time how the Christian faith tended to look different depending on where you live. So we had this conversation one evening about that very thing. How does the church look where you live? And the two southern women both had at one point lived up in the north, and they said in their southern drawl, which I'm not going to try to replicate because it'll be disrespectful, I'm sure, but she said, you know, in the south, we talk about Jesus all the time. We're always talking about Jesus. In the north, not so much do we talk about Jesus. We will talk about God when we have to but not so much with the Jesus. I thought, well, isn't that interesting? You know, and it probably doesn't mean any deep difference in theology. It's just sort of one of those social customs, you know? But I did start to think, do, do we make God into our own image or do we try to live ourselves into to God's image? When I was in school in Chicago, I had a number of Jewish friends in one of my classes, and they said, oh, yeah, when I... When I'm driving to and from school, I turn on that Christian gospel radio station. I listen to it all the time. I said, you're Jewish. Why are you listening to this Christian gospel radio station? And they said, well, we just love to hear them say the name of, of Jesus. They got a big kick out of that, you know. The whole, the whole Jesus thing was fascinating. The name of Jesus, the name itself. I think about that old song by the Gaithers. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about that name. There's something about the name Jesus. But what difference does it make in our lives? You know, and there's this scripture, there's at least three, three reactions worth noting. The first one we mentioned that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. He was on a divine mission, but the people would not receive him. He ran into another metaphorical brick wall. They apparently knew that he was on a mission, but they didn't want anything to do with it. Or maybe it's because they figured, well, he's on his way to Jerusalem. He's not going to have any time for me. In some way, they had expectations that Jesus was not fulfilling. And when what he wanted to do upset them, they rejected him. Now the disciples, as the scripture went on, react in a rather, well, surprising and alarming way, actually. Did you catch in scripture what they said as Emmerich read it? The Samaritans rejected Jesus and the disciples, and so the followers say... Let's call down fire from heaven and destroy the Samaritans. Well, maybe it's not that surprising that they would say that because, again, the Jews and the Samaritans didn't get along, and the disciples apparently weren't above ethnic prejudice, and so they knew that in the past God had brought fire down to destroy their enemies. They wanted to see that Jesus got to Jerusalem. Jesus chided them. In fact, it says he rebuked them. So that wasn't the right response either. And then the scripture goes on and 
Jesus encounters other people, and you see those other people had already made plans. Scripture says, he told one person, follow me, and the person says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus says, well, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and spread the news of God's kingdom. That seems like a pretty respectable thing to take care of your own family. Another person says, I'll follow you, Lord, but, but first I have to go and say goodbye to the people in my house. And Jesus says, don't look back. I don't know if Jesus meant that literally or not, but the point is that the others had plans. Yeah, I'll follow you, Jesus, as, as soon as I take care of the things in my to-do list. And you know what? Who can blame them? I mean, in 2008, I was faced with the opportunity to go into full-time ministry, and what did I do? I waited until 2010 because my son was going to graduate from high school. So maybe I wasn't any different than the people in that story. I think Jesus understood that our own plans can actually get in the way of God's plans sometimes. So it's a reasonable request, and yet Jesus expects them to drop all their plans and follow him. How unreasonable does that seem? Why? Because Jesus knew that what he was doing makes a difference. And I think he knew that sometimes the things that we get wrapped up in doing don't make a difference, at least not the kind of difference that are wrapped up in God's hopes and dreams. Which brings us back to that question. Does Jesus make a noticeable difference in our lives? Does the grace and mercy of God extend deep enough into our daily calendar and our daily ritual and our daily routines that it shapes our lives? Or do we shape our faith to fit the lives that we have already planned? Well, I think if we're honest, we have to admit that the latter is often true. You know why? Because I think all of us have a deep-seated desire to be in control. I don't know about you. Anybody here like being out of control? <laughs> Jolene's pointing at her son. <laughs> Go for it. Anybody feel like they're out of control right now? We don't like to feel out of control. We want to maintain some semblance of order in our lives because the world is chaotic enough and it's confusing enough. And Jesus here doesn't seem willing to concede to our desire to control. He says his mission comes before our plans, even the plans that seem the most reasonable. Yes, I'll wait and I'll, I'll, I'll move in 2010 because I want to make sure that this part of my life stays under control. And I'm not saying I regret that personal decision. I think there was a lot of faith to it. But what it does is it tests the depth of our devotion to Jesus' call on our lives. And it makes us think, does it not? And I think it's because Jesus knows that we really aren't in control, even when we delude ourselves into thinking we are. Maybe our being in control is illusion. When you hear the prayer requests that bubble up on a Sunday morning, a lot of those things aren't things that we would ever choose. And so we offer those struggles up to God. Our hopes and our plans can often be dashed. So maybe the promise of the gospel even isn't that we're not in control or that God is in control, but perhaps is that in Jesus, God joins us in our out of controlness and holds on to us, and brings us to the other side. That takes us from the confusion, and the despair, and the uncertainty, and the out-of-controlness, and brings us to that place of peace. Maybe that's the difference that Jesus makes in our lives. Maybe that's the promise of the gospel. Maybe that doesn't seem like enough promise for us. 
you know, when we go through things that we don't have control over, when we lose power in the middle of the night because of a storm and our alarm clock doesn't go off in the morning, or if we go through a few years of addiction or a few months of chemo, maybe when our life is out of control, that promise of God starts to feel pretty real and pretty trustworthy. And maybe, just maybe, that's faith. And when we, like Jesus' disciples, fall short, then what we do is that we give thanks that Jesus set his face toward Jerusalem. And even when he was denied, and even when he faced obstacle, he took on our chaotic lives and joined us in the turbulence of our daily existence, and he said nothing, nothing, will separate us from the love of God. And so he repeats his call, follow me. Would you join me in prayer? Oh, gracious God, by the word of your scripture, we are reminded that Jesus is the image of the invisible firstborn of all creation. For by Jesus, Scripture says, all things were created, all things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Jesus is before all things, and in him, O oh God, all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. In everything, he has supremacy. For you have said, O God, that in Jesus your fullness is pleased to dwell. And through him you have reconciled to yourself all things, all things in earth and in heaven. God, thank you for reconciling us to your love in Jesus by making peace through him. For this we give you thanks. And we pray. Jesus' name.